I want to give a special thanks and welcome to those of you who are joining us online. Good to see you this morning. Uh, we're continuing in our message series called Words Matter. Last week we talked about complaining, and that really seemed to strike a chord with many of you, uh, as I heard back from, from several of you. Um, I want to introduce the theme from this week's message by telling you a story about my fifth grade teacher. Um, when I was in fifth grade, uh, I'll never forget when my teacher had me stand up in, in class and put my hands out in front of me like this. Um, I was probably, you know, daydreaming or something. I don't think I was being a distraction of any sort, but I'm sure I probably wasn't being overly engaged. And so he had me put my hands out like this and stand up in front of the class. And then he said, they're perfect. That they're, they're perfect for holding a broom because that's all you're ever going to amount to someday. You're going to be nothing more than a street sweeper. Now, maybe that was a strange way of him trying to, ins to inspire me in whatever way. It didn't work. And then he went on to say, he said, one day when I drive by and I see you sweeping the streets, I'll roll down my window and I'll flip a quarter out at you. You know, I got to tell you, as a fifth grader, those words rattled me. And I began to wonder if my teacher was right. But I, but I, praise the Lord, I actually had parents that believed in me and they spoke words of life into me. And my dad was so intentional about this because his dad did not do this with him. And so he would often remind me, Jeremy, don't ever forget your name. Your name means appointed by God. And we gave you that name for a reason. And he would say things like, Jeremy, uh, Make sure that you're pursuing and honoring God in all that you say and do. And I believe in you, Jeremy. I believe in you. And so my parents would keep speaking words of life over and over and over to help counteract some of those criticisms. You know, whoever said sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. That person couldn't be any more wrong. Words are powerful. Words really matter. I want to show you what the scripture has to say about that. In Proverbs 18, 21, it says, death and life are in the power of the tongue. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. You know, our words are powerful. Our words matter. Well, today our topic uh, is the issue of criticism. Now, when I'm talking about criticism, I'm not talking about the constructive feedback that we, we give pe because we care about people and we want to help them get better. My parents did this for me as well. But what I'm talking about is the critical nitpicking, the unkind, the uninformed, cruel criticism that so often goes on. We're talking about the rampant problem of criticism. Now, some of you are listening right now, and you are smiling, and you're thinking to yourself, you're like, oh, thank you, Lord. I just can't wait for my spouse to hear this one. Um, or you, you're thinking, I can't wait to pass on this link to my boss. And you're thinking about all the people that you can't wait for to hear this. But the problem with that is that it can easily cause us to miss out on what God wants to say to us in our life on this area, because, the critici because criticism is, is really difficult to see in the mirror, because we hate it when other people criticize us, but we often don't realize when we're criticizing other people, because we often feel justified in criticizing them, because, you know, if they just weren't so weird, or if they just weren't so stupid, or if they would just not make so many unwise decisions with their money, then we wouldn't have to criticize them, because after all, we know what's best for their life, right? <laughs> kind of like, God has a wonderful plan for your life, and so do I. So if you don't live up to my expectations, my plan, then I'm going to criticize you for the way that you raise your kids. I'm going to criticize you for the way that you dress. I'm going to cri criticize the things that you post on social media or the way that you drive. And, and, and that place that you went on vacation, you and I both know that you're in debt and you have no business going on that vacation. Now, I don't know about you. I don't know where you're at in this area of your life. Maybe this is hitting close to home, or, or maybe it's not. Maybe this is only my problem, but I don't think so. And so let me tell you what I want to do today. I want to I show you a very popular verse in the Bible. In fact, this is so popular that even if you're not a Christ follower, 
you're probably familiar with this verse. You may actually even know this verse. Chances are good that most people, however, don't know the verse that comes right after this very famous verse. Okay, and so I'm gonna look at the popular verse first, and then I want you to see what comes right after that verse. So the Apostle Paul said this to the believers in Galatia, in Galatians chapter 5, verses 14 through 15, he said this, he says, for the whole law can be summed up in this one command. He says, love your neighbor as yourself. Okay, again, most people have heard love your neighbor as yourself. But now look at the very next thing Paul says after that famous verse. Check this out in verse 15. He says, but if you're allowing, if you're always biting and devouring one another, watch out. Beware of destroying one another. He says, you need to love your neighbor as yourself, but then he warns us to be careful. He says, if your words are constantly critical, if you're always cutting into people, if you're always devouring people, if your words are harsh, you need to be careful because your words matter. Your words could destroy one another. Now think about this. For some of you, what if your critical words are actually destroying the potential intimacy that you could have in your marriage? What if your critical words are driving a wall between you and your children? What if there are people who are far from God that are missing out on the goodness of Jesus because they can't get over how critical you are about everything and anything? Paul says, if you're really serious about loving others as yourself, then you need to be careful with your words and that they don't end up hurting those around you. Your words are powerful. Your words matter. Now, I want you to look at a couple of other verses that uh, some scholars actually call these verses contrasting verses. Okay, there, there is a lot of contrasting verses in the Bible. And a contrasting verse is a verse that says one thing about a subject and then it'll say something on the opposite side of that very same verse. And so I want to invite you to look with me at Proverbs 12, verse 18. This is a great contrasting verse. And so we're going to, here's one side of it, okay? It says this. It says, some people make what? Some people make cutting remarks. Okay, you know how this is. You know what cutting remark is. Your grandma says to you, uh, did you lose your phone? And you're like, well, no, grandma, I don't know. No, why, why do you ask? And she says, well, because you haven't called me in like over two weeks. And I was just making sure, you know, that you didn't lose it because I could have been dead and nobody would have known any better. Okay, <laughs> that, that's a cutting remark. You just had a grandma burn right there. <laughs> okay, some people make cutting remarks, the Bible says. Now, now he goes on, on. Here's the other side of that verse. He says, but the words of the wise bring healing. Okay, some people cut and hurt and criticize, but other people speak words of wisdom, and those words build up. They don't tear down. They create healing. And then the Apostle Paul says it this way. Look at what he says in Ephesians 4.29. He says, do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouths, but only, okay, notice that, but only what is helpful for building others up according to their needs, that it may benefit those who listen. He said, don't let any unwholesome, unhelpful, impure words come out of your mouth. Don't tear other people down. Instead, the only words you speak should be words that are helpful, words that are building others up according to their needs. Okay, listen, here's what, here's what you'll, I hope you'll understand today. You have no idea how a single word of criticism can pierce someone's soul and stick with them for years and years and years. And on the other side of that, you have no idea how God can use a single word of encouragement to build someone up and to give them the faith to go on. Your words have power. Your words matter. Proverbs says, some people make cutting remarks, but the words of the wise bring healing. And then the Apostle Paul says, do not let any unwholesome talk come out of your mouth, but only that which is helpful for building others up according to their needs. You have no idea how one word of criticism can really take one person down. And you have no idea how God can cause one word of encouragement to build up faith in order for someone to keep going who really needs it. You know, my fifth grade teacher, he was a life taker in that moment. But my dad, he was a life giver. And he would often tell me, I believe in you, Jeremy. I believe in you. 
Our words have the power of life and they have the power of death. And so here's what I want to do. I want to ask you this. What kind of a person do you want to be? Okay, let me ask you that again. What kind of a person do you want to be? Because there's really only two, two choices and we're going to unpack those two choices today and we're going to flesh those out. And the first one is this. You can be a fault finder, okay? A fault finder. And quite honestly, this is what most people are. Because of our sin nature, we tend to look at what's wrong before we look at what's right. Now, those of you who are married, oh, please listen to me if you're married. Oh, be so, so careful here. Because it is so, so easy to be a fault finder. You can take a relatively good person and you can pick them apart before you even get to lunch on that day, right? It's kind of like, I don't like the way you walk. I don't like the way you chew. I don't like the jokes that you tell. I don't like the way that you snore. I don't like the way you breathe, okay? Or you go into work and you're like, I don't like the way that she runs her meetings. I don't like the way that they talk. Uh, I don't think anybody has a real plan around here. Uh, these people are all a bunch of idiots. Or we can say things like, you know, this is the stupidest place I've ever been. Or I can't believe the pictures she posts on Instagram. She says she loves Jesus, but it looks like she loves her body. But, you know, I'm not judging or anything. I'm just saying. Or we can be like, hey, can you believe the way that they raise their kids? I mean, if they're going to raise their kids like that, they might as well just go ahead and drop them off prison right now because it's not going to make any difference. They, they, these kids don't stand a chance with the way that they're, they're being raised. Or we can say, oh, the way they drive their car, I mean, my goodness, Pastor Jeremy, oh, it's a good thing he doesn't have a bumper sticker on his car because they, he certainly isn't being a good witness for Jesus. All right? That one may actually be legit, okay? I, I probably own that one. But, but whatever it is, it's easy to be a fault finder. Now, if you're a fault finder, let me just remind you, you're a lot like a Pharisee, okay? One of the religious leaders. The Pharisees were, were religious leaders. You're a lot like a Pharisee if you're a fault finder. Because um, this is exactly what a Pharisee would do. They would find the fault. Now, 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 listen, you're not only like a Pharisee, but you're actually like the devil as well. Because the Bible has all sorts of different names and descriptions of Satan, such as the deceiver, the devourer, the prince of darkness, the father of lives. But another name that the Bible calls him is the accuser. And it's because he accuses the people before God day in and day out. And so what does that mean? What does he do? Okay, listen, he finds fault. He finds fault fault. And that's what the Pharisees did. And that's what the devil does. And the reality is, we're being honest. That's what a lot of us do. And so why do we do it? Why do we do it? Well, very quickly, there's three reasons. Um, the, the reason we do this is because a lot of times we are full of pride. Okay. We think we know what's best. Another reason is we're insecure. And so we criticize what we see in others, and many times it's the very things that are our weaknesses inside of us. A third reason is because we don't understand. We misunderstand. And so often we criticize others from a distance, and it's things we know nothing about, but we think we do. For example, um, you can criticize a whole lot about the church. But if you had context, you might be like, oh, I understand. That makes sense now. Now that I have more of the context. Okay, look, it's like this. Um, before Ann and I had our own kids, I would criticize parents all day long for how they didn't discipline their two-year-old child in the grocery store. Okay, I, for that matter, it didn't even have to be in the grocery store. It could just be kids that were what I considered unruly. I would criticize them. And the reason is because I never had kids and because I never had my own two-year-old, okay? And when you have your own two-year-old, even if you normally have good kids, but whenever they hit that two-year mark or that three-year mark, okay, you come to realize that there's just these moments, okay? And there's just these moments that you can't negotiate with terrorists, all right? You, you don't know that, though, until you have your own two-year-old. But then once you do, you just don't judge anybody. And you're kind of like, in that moment, you're kind of like, I know this is bad parenting, but we're in the grocery store, so I just surrender. I put up the white flag. I give up. You can have the candy. Just shut up, kid. Okay, I'll buy you a Porsche. You can have a pony. Just get in the car. Please don't embarrass us. And so if you're like me, maybe you used to judge people, 
because you just didn't understand. I, I, I need to tell you this right now, okay? When you criticize others, here's a lot of times when we criticize, here's a lot of times what we think. We tend to think, well, this makes me look smarter, or this makes me look and feel like I'm an expert on this area, or this just shows how good that I am. And you know, now that I'm saying this out loud, you know, I'm kind of a good person. But what it really does is it makes you look insecure. It makes you look mean-spirited. That's what it makes you look like. Ask yourself this, have you ever met a critical person that you want to be like? I mean, listen, I have never met a critical person that I wanted to be like at any point in my life. In fact, there's a verse in the Bible about this. And I'm going to show you this verse. And you may actually criticize me for bringing up this verse. But I want you to understand, okay, let me just say this. I want you to understand, this is the word of God. Now listen to me. When I read this verse, fellas, come on. I, I, I need you, if you don't listen to anything else, I need you to tune in to me right here. Okay, fellas. As I, as I read this verse, I want you to do this. I want you to look straight ahead at the screen. Don't elbow anybody. Don't let your heart rate go up. Don't you dare nod. And certainly don't say amen if you want to keep living. You just keep breathing normal and just let God do what he wants to do. This is not your place. This is all in his hands. <laughs> Some of you are going to get so mad at me. I, I'm, I'm sorry, all right? But... There, there's more coming, so stick with me. Hang with me, all right? You ready for the verse? Here it comes. Proverbs 21, 19 says, It's better to live alone in the desert than with a quarrelsome, complaining wife. Now may God add his blessing to the reading of his word. Amen? Okay, I think we're done. <laughs> okay, listen, listen, listen. There's, a, there, there's not a verse about men, but if I ever get to add a verse to the Bible, <laughs> it'll be 1 Jeremy 21, 19, and it'll say something like, it's better to get bamboo shoots in your fingernails than to live with a man who's constantly picking you apart. <laughs> All right. Listen, it goes both ways. It goes both ways. This isn't, this isn't so much about a gender thing. This is more about the principle thing of a critical person. Okay, listen, I've never met a critical person that I wanted to be like or that I wanted to spend much time with. And so I want to ask you, for those of you who are like me that have battled with a very critical spirit, and it's so difficult to see in the mirror, I get it, because we justify what we do because we feel like we actually have a right to pick people apart. Let me ask you, do you want to be a fault finder or do you want to be a hope dealer? Okay, that's hope with an H, not D as in dope, okay? All right, just want to make sure that you heard me correctly. I said hope dealer, okay? For those of you online up in Michigan, I forget, you don't deal up there. You're actually just consumers, right? <laughs> don't eat the brownies. Okay, I can't believe I say this stuff. Really, somebody should edit me out here. Anyway, I said hope dealer, just so you all know that. Um, you can either be, one, a fault finder, or two, you can be a hope dealer, okay? Now, check out what the Bible says in Romans 15, verse 13. The Apostle Paul says this. Listen to the hope that he says. He says, may the God of hope fill you all with joy and peace as you trust in him. Why? So that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Okay, man, Paul was a chief hope dealer. Anytime he'd speak, anytime he'd write, he wasn't gonna tear people down, he was going to build them up. He wasn't gonna let any unwholesome talk come out of his mouth, but only that which was helpful, that which would build life into other people. He was a supreme hope dealer. In fact, if you just read some of his writings, my favorite chapter in all of the Bible is Romans chapter 8. And the Apostle Paul wrote this. And I want you to listen to the words of hope that, that Paul shares. In fact, I want to challenge you and actually encourage you to read the entire chapter this week. In fact, I would challenge you to even read it a couple times this week. But I, I just kind of uh, highlighted some of the parts out of this one particular chapter that Paul wrote. And he starts it out and he says this. Listen to the hope in Romans chapter 8. He says, um, there is no condemnation for those of you who are in Christ Jesus. Okay? There's great hope right off the bat there. Then another highlight there is the Holy Spirit helps you in your weakness. Okay? That gives me hope. 
He says, Jesus is making intercession at the right hand of God the Father right now. That gives me hope. You're more than a conqueror through Christ Jesus. That gives me hope. Okay, and then he finishes it out by saying this, neither death nor life, neither demons nor angels, neither powers or the present or the future, neither height nor depth, neither anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Let me ask you again. Do you want to be a fault finder or do you want to be a hope dealer? The Pharisees were fault finders. The devil is a fault finder. But Jesus is full of hope. You know, I love the different metaphors that the Bible gives us of Jesus. He, he, he's the bread of life. He's the living water. He's the good shepherd. He's the door. He's the living vine. He's the gate. He's the king of kings, the Lord of lords. He's the alpha and the omega, the beginning and the end. That's what that means. Now, let me tell you what else, according to scripture, that he is. First Timothy calls Jesus our hope. Titus 2 calls Jesus the blessed hope. First Peter calls Jesus the living hope. See, whenever someone would sin, the Pharisees would point out the sin and they would accuse them. And Jesus would come along and he would call sin for what it was, but then he would offer hope on how to walk away from the bondage of sin. Okay, in John chapter 8, there's a familiar story about a woman who's caught in adultery. And what do the Pharisees do? The Pharisees said, stone her. The law says, put her to death. And listen, that's exactly what the law said. The Pharisees were quick to point out everything that was wrong. But Jesus responded to the situation differently. Instead, Jesus knelt down in the sand and he started writing something. Now, we're not exactly sure what it was that he wrote. Many scholars believe that most likely he was writing out some of the sins of these Pharisee men right there in the sand. And uh, because what happened was, is from the oldest to the youngest, they started walking away. Okay? They walked away. And then what did Jesus do? Jesus knelt down next to this woman who was broken, who was full of shame. And then he said to her, woman, my daughter, where are your fault finders? Where are your accusers? Where are those who tried to condemn you? And she looked up and she said, they're all gone. And Jesus said, neither do I condemn you. Don't do this anymore. There's a better way. He said, go your way and don't sin anymore. But you can find forgiveness. You can find life. You can find real love. I'll ask you again. What do you want to be? Do you want to be a fault finder? That's what the Pharisees were. That's what our spiritual enemy is. He's known as the prince of darkness, the father of lies, the great deceiver, the accuser of the brothers and sisters. That's exactly what the scripture says of him. He's the accuser of the brothers and sisters. Who is Jesus? The Bible says he's the way, he's the truth, he's the life. He is our living hope. He's our blessed hope. He is our hope. I don't know about you, but I want to be a hope dealer much like what my dad was with me. In fact, I wanna challenge you and encourage you to write this down, write, write these four words down. I believe in you. I believe in you. And I wanna challenge you this week to actually use those words, sincerely use those words with someone this week. Watch the power that happens when you use those words. Those words, when they are said, and especially when it's by somebody significant, those are powerful words. Words can bring hope. Words shape. Words matter. You know, this reminds me about a true story about a little girl named Cheryl. Um, when Cheryl was four years old, she often hung around her parents' small country store. Almost daily, the milkman would come for a visit, and she would follow him around as he lined the display, uh, the, the display cases with the shiny bottles of milk. And he always greeted her the same way every day. He would pat her on the head and say, how's my little Miss America today? How's my little Miss America? How's my little Miss America? Okay. And day after day after day, he would pat her on the head. How's my little Miss America? And, you know, at first she just kind of giggled and laughed it off. But eventually she began to think, well, maybe I could become Miss America. And he'd keep saying, how's my little Miss America? Well, eventually she became very comfortable with this idea of becoming Miss America. And one day she decided to pursue it. And sure enough, Cheryl Pruitt became Miss America. 
And when Cheryl was interviewed, she said, it all started with the milkman, <laughs> which is a little strange. <laughs> but then she went on to say, God used the milkman to speak a word into my young, impressionable mind. And I started to believe it. And now it is a reality. You know, those words breathed hope and inspiration, and they helped shape her for the rest of her life. You know, as a parent, I've really taken the lesson from that story to heart. Every day, I pat my daughter on the head, and I just say, how's my little Miss Millionaire doing? How's my little Miss Millionaire? Take care of daddy, right? <laughs> well, let me give you another example of how Jesus spoke hope and inspiration to help shape. In Matthew 16, Jesus did this with a fisherman named Simon. A clumsy, big-mouthed, impulsive fisherman. Jesus saw the difference between the real and the ideal. And Jesus says, you know what, Simon? I'm going to change your name. I'm going to call you Peter. In the original Greek, uh, he calls him Petros, which means rock, stable, trustworthy, capable. Okay? You, you know, I could just imagine Peter's friends, the other disciples around him, laughing and criticizing and saying, yeah, right. Rock? Yeah, I'm sure. How about pebbles? Okay? But, but Jesus saw the difference between the real and the ideal, and he says, I'm going to paint a picture of who I know that you can become through me, Peter. And he breathed this simple word of hope into his soul. And if you look into the book of Acts later on at the development of the early church, do you know who was the crucial rock? It was Peter. It was Peter. Listen, listen, please don't miss this. You have no idea when you're hard on your kids how it belittles them and distances them from you. And you have no idea, you have no idea when you criticize your spouse what that does to the self-esteem and the intimacy in your marriage. You have no idea how foolish you look when you criticize and criticize and criticize and you somehow think it makes you look better. It actually makes you look insecure and mean-spirited. And you have no idea how God can use one word of encouragement to change a life. You have no idea when you speak the best about others, how God can build them up through you. Once again, the Bible says, let no unwholesome talk come out of your mouth, but only, but only that which is helpful for building others up according to their needs. And so your kid, you know what? Your kid may not be the tidiest kid, but she's got a great heart. And so you tell her that. You say, you know what, honey, you're amazing. I love what I see in you. I love the way that you speak about others. You build them up. Your wife, she may not be the most organized, but she's an incredible mom. And so instead of picking her apart for what she's not, build her up for who she is and what she is. You know, you say things like, I, you know, honey, I love the way that you love our kids. I could have never married anyone that would impart more life into our children. Your husband, he may not win the yard of the month award. Maybe he doesn't even like, you know, maybe he doesn't even like mowing the yard. Maybe it even looks kind of bad. But the next time he does it, you just say, you look so sexy out there in those black socks pushing that lawnmower. I love to see the way that you do that. Thanks for working so hard for our family. Okay. Words of life, words of life, words of life, words of life. You have no idea how God can use your words to build someone up. And you might be saying, Jeremy, you're a little bit passionate about that. Now, you know, why are you so passionate about this subject? That's because I can have the most critical spirit you'd ever see. You see, when my relationship with God gets neglected, when it gets put on the back burner, I can allow words from my past to have an unnecessary and an unhealthy voice in my life. And it can cause me to feel insecure and critical in my spirit when I'm not taking those thoughts captive and taking them before the Lord. But here's the thing. The more intentionally close that I get to God, the more aware I become of, my, in, of my, my sinfulness, the more aware I become of my insecurities. And the more aware I become of my sinfulness, the more I become aware of the magnitude of God's grace and because of who he is and what he's done for me. And so I will spend less time criticizing the speck in someone else's eye, and I'll start allowing the Holy Spirit to lovingly address the log that is in my own eye. 
You see, when I prioritize my relationship with God, he breathes his life-giving hope in me, and it reaffirms who God is and what he's done. And he reminds me of how he's forgiven me and how he's loved me, even though I don't deserve it. And when I'm secure in his love, it gives me hope. And then I'm compelled to not tear others down, but to build others up and to speak his hope into their lives. You know, just like my dad asked me, let me ask you this, listen, who are we? We need to remember who we are. We need to remember who we are. Who are we? We are the people of God. Don't ever forget that. Don't ever forget who you are. We are people of God. We are hope dealers. We point people to Jesus, the living hope. We point people to Jesus, the King of Kings. We point people to Jesus, the one who forgives brokenness and heals all infirmities. We point people to Jesus, our Savior, our King, our Lord. We point people to hope. We're not fault finders. Anybody can be a fault finder. The Pharisees were fault finders. The devil is a fault finder. We are followers of Jesus. We speak words of healing, we speak words of life. You have no idea, no idea how a single critical word can pierce, kill, and destroy. You're never going to amount to anything more than a street sweeper, Jeremy. You have no idea how a single word of encouragement makes a difference. Don't ever forget your name, Jeremy. Your name means appointed by God, and I believe in you. You have no idea how God can use a single word of encouragement to push you forward, to build your faith, to transform you even more into the image of Christ. And so again, what do you want to be? What do you want to be? I want to lead a church full of hope dealers, pointing people to the one who is our living hope, our Savior, our King of Kings, our Lord Jesus. Let's pray together. God, I thank you once again for your word and for your presence with us today. And Father, we ask that you would do a healing and even a convicting work in our hearts. And God, I just confess that that I've been one who has had a critical spirit. I ask for your forgiveness for that. And God, would you help us to become aware of our sin and our need for you? God, help us to be keenly aware of the magnitude of your grace to the point that that we wouldn't even have time to point out the faults in others, but instead that we would offer words of hope and words of healing. God, help us to not be fault finders. May we be life givers and hope dealers. And so God, every every time we feel like we want to criticize, The times we want to point something out that's wrong in others, God, I pray that we would remember all that's wrong with us and not waste a breath on tearing someone else down. God, we want you to use our words. We want you to use our heart, use our spirit to build others up, and most importantly, to point point them towards you, Jesus. Empower us to say wise words that bring about healing. God, we pray that there would be no unwholesome talk that comes out of our mouth, but only that which is helpful, only that which is helpful for building others up according to their needs. God, wherever we are, help us to represent the living hope through your son, Jesus. And once again, we thank you, Jesus, for dying on the cross and as the payment for our sins. And we praise you again for the hope and the life that we have in you. And we pray all of this in the powerful name of Jesus. And everyone agreed and said, amen. Amen.